Can you explain the fundamentals of jiu-jitsu? Yes. If I couldn't, I wouldn't be much of a coach. <laughs> um, jiu-jitsu is an art and science which looks to use a combination of tactical and mechanical advantage to focus a very high percentage of my strength against a very low percentage of my opponent's strength at a critical point on their body, such that if I were to exert my strength upon that critical point, they could no longer continue to fight. Well, that's about weapons and defenses. But then, is there something more to be said about the set of tools that are that we're talking about? That's where the art comes in, because ultimately you have a set of choices and those choices that you make will be a, an act of self-expression on your part. Some will prefer this, some will prefer that. That's where you come in as an individual. That's an overall definition of jiu-jitsu, of being a set of choices that where you're using the things you're powerful in versus the things your opponent is weak in. No, I was only talking about percentages of body strength. If I have, for example, let's say um, we have two athletes, athlete A and athlete B. Athlete A has 100 units of strength, however we define that overall. Athlete B has 50. Okay, so ostensibly, athlete A is twice as strong as athlete B. But athlete B can maneuver his body into a set of positions focused around a critical point of his opponent's body where he can apply 40 units of strength out of his total of 50. His opponent can only defend with 20 units of strength out of his total of 100. You have now completely reversed the strength discrepancy. Originally, athlete A was twice as strong as B. Now, on that one localized point, the knee, the elbow, the neck, B is now twice as strong as A. Under those circumstances, B should win. I guess what I'm trying to get at, by the way, that's really beautifully said, is what you just said could be applied to other games, other battles. It could be applied to the game of chess. Uh, it could be applied to war. Uh, most obviously in war. I think about, um, for example, um, the American strategic bombing campaign in World War II. Uh, the Eighth Army Air Force was tasked with the idea of destroying German industry. Did they attack all of German industry? Of course not. That would be stupid. They attacked the ball bearing industry. Why? Because almost all of modern machines require ball bearings in order to operate. In order for the mechanical interfaces of machines to operate, you have to reduce friction. It's done through ball bearings. If you knocked out one tiny component of German industry, the ball bearing industry, the rest of it couldn't operate. So too with the human body. I don't have to fight your whole body. I just have to fight your left knee. If I can break your left knee, the rest of your body is irrelevant to me. But then isn't the art of jiu-jitsu discovering the the left knee, the discovering the weak points. Yeah, a huge part of jiu-jitsu is understanding the weak, strengths and weaknesses of the human body. There's parts of the human body that are shockingly robust, and there are other parts that are shockingly vulnerable. The major joints, and of course the most vulnerable of all, the unprotected neck. So if we take the something I'm not familiar with, but I was incredibly impressed by is the body lock that I saw, um, Nick Rodriguez. Nick Rodriguez used uh, last time uh, a few weeks ago. Yes. But then I also got to hang out with Craig Jones, who showed who also that. Also has a very good body lock. So that uh, that was, uh, I don't know if this body lock applies to all positions, but I was seeing it from when Craig is uh, on top of your opponent and trying to pass the guard or passing the guard use the body lock as a controlling position. The The principle behind it is that it shuts down, as you've spoken about, it shuts down the weapons of a very strong opponent. That's absolutely correct. In, in the case of um, guard position, what makes guard position 
dangerous, what makes someone a powerful guard player is the movement of their hips, forward and backward and side to side. Body locking is designed to shut down that movement and does a, a very fine job of it. You'll see all of my students accelerate. Gordon Ryan is probably the single best body lock guard passer I've ever seen. Nicky Ryan is outstanding with it. Nick Rodriguez is very good. Craig Jones is outstanding. All of my students use this for a very simple reason. Understand what is the central problem of shutting down a dangerous guard player. It's his hips. That's what makes him a dangerous leg locker. You go up against a dangerous leg locker, body lock guard pass. Single best way to shut down most of his entries. Um, we're all strong in leg locks. So in our gym, you got to control the hips as soon as possible. It's gonna, otherwise, it's going to be a very difficult thing to avoid leg entanglements as you go to pass. And uh, uh, across the board, my students excel in, in, uh, in body lock guard passing. They understand what's the most dangerous feature their opponent has, the lateral movement of their hips. What's the single best way to stop that? Body lock and then work from there.